Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Interviews by a Black Independent. I'm Dr. Jesse Fields. Hi, I'm Alvader Frazier, and welcome. Uh, Jesse and I are really proud to be the executive producers of this event tonight. And uh, I know we've had some rain outside, but we've got a rainbow in here. So you all look great. Give yourself a hand. Tonight, we're going to hear from the country's leading African-American independent, a woman who made history by being the first African-American and the first woman to be on the ballot in all 50 states for president. She laid the foundation for the modern independent movement. In, a, in addition, Dr. Filani is a developmental psychologist an innovator who's worked with the All Stars Project, which she's co founder of. The All Stars Project has created the country's most successful developmental youth programs, the Free Developmental Adult Learning Center called UX, the Cops and Kids Conversation Program, where young people and cops come together to create a new possibilities and understandings of each other. We will be hearing from Dr. Filani, and then we will all have a chance to join in this very, very important conversation. Please welcome Dr. Lenora Filani. executive co-producers, Dr. Jesse Fields and Alveda Frazier Esquire for that wonderful introduction. Also, Kathy Stewart, um, who is the uh, New York City Independence Party coordinator. Um, I also want to thank deeply the Committee for Independent Community Action, who did what I asked them to do, which is to go out and talk to the people and bring them here. And Jamela Stevens for the role that you played in. Um, I want to begin this talk tonight by sending our best wishes and thoughts to the young people who are on the ground in Ferguson, Missouri, and have been there for the past two and a half years fighting a good fight, taking a stand against the wanton racist and racist destruction of our young people by the police and other forces. Two of the young warriors, Alexis Templeton and Brittany Fell, were planning to fly in this morning for the meeting, but called us to let us know that in response to the current roundup by the police of young protesters last night, that they could not leave. Last night's protest was in response to the leaking by the authorities, leaking in the post, of the autopsy report on Michael Brown which shared that he had been shot in the hand, which of course supports the authority's position that it was all, already all right to kill him because he was tussling with the cop, even though he was actually a good distance away from the officer when he was actually shot to death. Whatever the final report, we all know that Michael Brown would not be dead if he were a white 16-year-old boy. History, both recent with Brown and Eric Gardner, and not so recent, has taught us that. I also want to acknowledge Jillian Bell, who you will hear from tonight, who's from Dallas, Texas, and like many other young people around the country, gets on buses, trains, and planes on weekends to join her peers in Ferguson, 
Jillian has been to Ferguson twice, and she will be later introduced, but I want you to stand up and give her a round of applause. So I'm, I'm, I love looking at this audience. Um, I woke up in the middle of the night a few months ago, and I said, I need to talk to my people. And I called people up and said, would you go out in the streets and speak, find them, bring them in, because there are lots of conversations that we have to have about the growing crises in our country and in our city and decide what we want to do about it. So give yourselves a round of applause for the show. I spent today looking at the documentaries, I'm part of it, the Freedom Riders and the courageous young people in 1964 who at the height of the civil rights movement, 700 strong, wrote their wills, got on buses from various places, traveled south, and inspired the hell out of the movement and country. They helped to move us forward. These young people knew something very important, which is that sometimes you just have to stand up and say no to injustice. You have to be willing to put something around. Even if you don't have a clue how the system works, at some point you just have to simply say no. And I am deeply proud of them. Sometimes, as in the case of the Soweto riots in Africa, it takes the young people of our world to step up and to help make visible the atrocities of our time. Tonight, I want to talk to you about two efforts that I have been part of leading aimed at addressing a lot of the issues that continue to plague our communities and our country. Many of you know of these efforts because you are participants and builders of them yourselves. And now is a moment to take out all of these movements bigger and broader and offer them to others and challenge people to stand up and respond. Our movements have to do with democracy, which means creating a system where ordinary people, poor people, have access to power and know how to use it in their own behalf. The other is the movement for development, which helps people grow in the midst of the wrongs of the world and crises in their lives. Crises that are looming over our communities and make it seem for many people that there is no place to go and nothing to do and that life is impossible. In some ways, I think that what is so important about Ferguson is our young people deciding that they would create something to do. They are creating a response. I want to speak for a moment about the crises of poverty. Dr. King died fighting for the poor, and that fight has yet to end. On Saturday, I was on Lenox Avenue and 135th Street organizing for this meeting. And in the two hours that I was out there, at least 10 people came up to me, two in wheelchairs, one who told me that they were homeless. One of the people in the wheelchair pointed to the corner where she slept each night, and the other, whose leg was dangerously swollen, said to me, can you help me please? Another brother came by who told me he was on his way to a shelter and had just come out of the hospital because whenever he drinks beer to dull his pain, he gets very ill. I thought about my father who used to clean the wine bottles from under his bed and my grandfather and uncles who drank to ease their pain, living in a society that has been hostile to them. The brother stood there as if waiting for me to castigate him. Instead, I gently touched him on the shoulder and told him to come to this meeting so that we could work on some other ways of easing his pain, not because we can solve his problems, but we can definitely give him some new ways of dealing with them. I have stood on street corners in Harlem doing organizing for more than three decades. And while there has always been, been poverty, on Saturday, with all the gentrified buildings in the background, there was also the palpable experience of people feeling and being abandoned 
and having no place to go and no one to speak about this thing. And it's not just in Harlem, it's in downtown Brooklyn and it's on its way to Brownsville in East New York and it's happening all around the country. Deals are being cut that don't include us, that don't include you. Tales being told in New York City that we're gonna build affordable houses in the parking lots of the NYCHA developments, which is supposedly for the best of the community, when the actual plan is to send people off to the boondocks or to dirty, stinky, run-down, and not fit for life shelters with mothers trying to put on a good face for their kids and our young people in classrooms that are dysfunctional because the public school system is a mess, trying to hide the fact that their home is a shelter, trying to hide a shame that is in no way their shame. Part of what I want us to be clear about is who that shame needs to be assigned to. It needs to be assigned, assigned to the leaders be they in politics, education, or on the pulpit, who refuse to support our community, refuse to take on these issues, and who refuse to lead. Dr. Fred Newman, who died in 2011, and people who still, still ask me about him when I'm out on the streets like this past Saturday, had to say this about homelessness in a book called The Myth of Psychology. He says, I walk down the street as we all do and I see homeless people. Above and beyond all the sociological and political analysis, there's the sheer fact of it. And that raises the profound issue, how could it be that we live in a society where this is possible? It is to me such a shocking outrage and a statement not about the person on the street, but about us collectively as a species. How could this be? Yet the fact is that it is so, and we can't attempt to solve the problem of homelessness by trying to go directly to the solution without mediating it through those elements of society which make it possible to do something. And I might add, we have to build those elements. Dr. Lenore Flani, he goes on to say, is distinguished, that's me, <laughs> African-American developmental psychologist is here with us tonight. I look at Dr. Falani and I think about her campaign for democracy. If we can make democracy live more, there might be a possibility of doing something about homelessness. We have to find a way to use those elements of our existing social system to deal with the outrage of these problems which directly confront us in history. I think that this experience, at least for me, is clo close to a direct historical experience. Homelessness is a historical outrage. It is an outrage to us as a collectivity of human beings that a person should be sleeping on the streets of New York. I don't even experience this as a political polemic. I think it's more than that. For me, it actually feels quasi-spiritual. How could it be? But it is. We can't deny either of those things, that it is and that we aren't in a position to confront the deck directly. I walk down the street and I feel a very strong pull to say, damn it, I'm simply going to do something about homelessness right now. I'm going to take people off the streets and put them in my home, then ring 100 doorbells to put them in those homes, and so on. We cannot allow this. I feel that every day and every night of the week, but it can't be done. I don't say that cynically, I say that sadly. Dr. Newman and I also were co-founders of the All Stars Project, which many of you know is on 42nd Street in Manhattan and houses both youth programs that have been in existence for more than three decades, as well as a university-style school for people of all ages to which more than 5,000 adults have come to classes, development coaching sessions, and volunteer opportunities for the last four years. All the programs are free. All the programs are aimed at helping to re reignite development in people of all ages. Development is almost like magic. 
It's how people grow in ways that allow them to frame their crises differently. It doesn't alleviate suffering, but it helps us make new kinds of decisions and different kinds of decisions, even in the midst of the madness that can be our lives. A question that I deal with both as a developmental psychologist and as a political leader is how do we create possibilities at a time when the ordinary basics of life, shelter, food, education, decent health care, and emotional stability are not there. Newman and I took those challenges on with the lots of other political and just decent people in the city. Newman grew up poor in the South Bronx, went to college on a GI Bill, and it was, it turned out, he was brilliant. He was trained as a philosopher at Stanford University in the early 60s, and he was a radical like me. And it turns out that he was an expert on things that might be possible, on possibility. Newman believed that people, ordinary people from which we both came, could identify, create, and seize upon possibilities in life, and that it is that activity that we call development. Many people in this room tonight have experienced the power of development and been overwhelmed by the fact that one can continue to develop until the day they die. And so our students, age six to 80, in all our different locations, have thrown themselves into this process, different programs, classes, and ways, and have experienced the joy of this experience even in the midst of their life struggles. Again, development does not solve our problems. It helps us to better navigate the world and come to real recognize that our failures aren't simply personal. They exist in the organization of the world. And that's very powerful stuff. So now I want to talk to you about politics. I want to say something about the importance of democracy and the role that the community has to play. You can't have the privilege of not liking messy politics because messy politics is what's controlling and screwing up your lives. So you have to touch it and you have to be a part of it. Seeing possibilities when it comes to politics are very, it's very hard and it's very limited. Take a look at American politics today. Look at Congress, look at our president, look at the mayor and the city council. Nothing is possible. Congress is a playground for partisan advantage. Nothing gets done. People are suffering. The educational system is falling apart. Poverty again is rising. People say there's a problem with income inequality, and the politicians and the parties can't do anything. They can do nothing. Everything is politicized. Everything is about partisan gain. That means it goes to the parties. The parties run the show. We the people have little power, and what power we do have is funneled into and captured by the parties. And then, they turn everything into what's good for them, not what's good for the people. This is wrong, and more than wrong, it is dangerous. But out of the headlines, and beyond Twitter and talk shows and TV news, there is a new political reform movement in this country that is growing. This movement is fundamentally about creating new possibilities in the political life of this country. I have been active in this movement for many years. My closest colleagues are leaders of the movement. And tonight, I want to give you a picture of how black people and poor people need to become empowered and can through this movement. As many of you know, in 1988, I ran for president, not as a Democrat, but as an independent. In that campaign, I became the first woman, first African American to succeed in getting in the ballot, on the ballot in all 50 states. This had never been done and was a huge accomplishment. I received a quarter of a million votes that year 
Those small smiles, it's a thing I wrote. Given the number of people, <laughs> given the number of people who have told me, Dr. Kalani, I voted for you in 1988, the count should be closer to five million. <laughs> that 1988 campaign was a small campaign, but it was politically important because in that campaign, where I traveled to every state in the country, I brought out two messages. First, I said that black people were being taken for granted by the Democratic Party, and that we had to find ways to have a kind of political independence that would change that. Second, my message was that there were very, very serious limitations to what the Democratic Party could and would deliver for us and to us. That poverty and that inequality could not be resolved by Democratic Party politics alone, as much as the Democrats might want us to believe that. For us, for the black community and for the communities of color, we have a particular relationship to the Democratic Party. In the 1950s and 60s in the South, where we fought the civil rights movement, the Democratic Party was in control and it kept us out. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, North and South Carolina, the so-called Black Belt, were under one party rule, the Democratic Party. And we were systematically excluded. There were literacy tests that no college graduate could pass, let alone a poor sharecropper. There were poll taxes. The registrar's office were miles from the plantations and farms where sharecroppers worked. No one had a car. You had to walk 20 miles to register, and if you dared to try to register to vote, you got told to withdraw your registration. If you didn't, you got fired if you had a job. When word got out that you were trying to exercise your constitutional right as an American citizen, you might get beaten by the local police or shot at, and in some cases, killed. We had to fight our way into the political process, and as a practical matter, that meant fighting our way into the Democratic Party. The Democrats ruled the South, and even though the mass migrations to the North in search of work had taken many of our families out of Dixie and to the urban politics of Chicago, Detroit, New Newark, and New York, it was in the South that the battle for voting rights reached its climax. After the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Movement broke the back of Jim Crow, legally speaking, and after President Johnson declared the war on poverty and Dr. King was assassinated, Black America became firmly rooted into the Democratic Party. But we hadn't always been Democrats. After all, the Republican Party, it came into being in the 19, 1850s as the anti-slavery movement was cresting. And after the Civil War, black people were mainly Republicans for 100 years. After all, the Democrats built the Ku Klux Klan. We fought our way in, and we were allowed in at a price show, but we were allowed in. By 1972, when the National Black Political Convention was held in Gary, Indiana, any debate over whether black people should consider an independent rather than a Democratic Party road was put to death. It was all about leveraging the black vote to win empowerment and social justice by electing black Democrats. That was to be the pathway out of poverty. This was 1972. That was to be the pathway out of injustice to equality that was to be the pathway to possibility. Election day is coming. It's coming also to Ferguson, Missouri. The messengers of the political status quo known to us as the Democratic Party are knocking on the doors, ringing cell phones, texting, and stuffing mailboxes with flyers. Remember Ferguson, they said. We must make things right in America. So be sure to come out and vote in record numbers in Georgia and North Carolina 
in Arkansas and Louisiana and vote for Democratic Party candidates in the U.S. Senate at all costs, we are told. Preserve the Democratic Party no matter how much it does not work to preserve a decent lifestyle for us. I wrote an article that was published in the Amsterdam News that contained both a quote by John Lewis, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Congressman, and Reverend Al Sharpton insisting that we do that. And I hope that the people around this country and in Ferguson know that this is not the road to go. The Democrats don't deserve our vote. They are in public offices in the places where we're being most harmed because they run our communities. And it would be a real mistake, and it's an outrage, <laughs> for elected officials to ask us to participate in this way. And we have to say no. We have to let the people in that area support them to say no. We cannot be fooled. And we can't continue to be taken for granted. We need to do some new things in the area of politics. First of all, we need to get into it. I would like everybody in here to register either as an independent or a non-affiliated voter. That would shake some things up. It wouldn't make you an alien. alien. It would make you someone who knows that we have to do something about this horrific political system that continues to take us for granted. We have to build coalitions that include all kinds of people. I've been doing that for 20 years. I worked with Ross Perot in 1992, Pat Buchanan, with Michael Bloomberg in um, 2005. We got him 47% of the black vote. I remember we went to bed thrilled because we had gotten the black community to vote outside of the DP in such numbers. We waited for the newspapers to come out and report this unbelievable event, and no paper in this entire city, state, or country has ever reported that. Because they don't want you to know that you have the power to move all over the ballot and make smart choices, that you can be innovative in politics, that you are not tied to any party, and you can do things that are in your best interest. What I want you to do is what I'm asking you to do. I want you to step outside of what is ordinary for our community and help us do some things that can impact upon the crisis. Power is an important thing to have, to create, to build as a community, and we so desperately need to do that. These crises are not going to go away. I just read um, several weeks ago, I assume that you did, an article about the failure of the public school, and one that was that in, I don't know, either 90 schools or some portion of them, not one black or Latino kid passed the statewide exam. An uproar should have occurred. <laughs> People should have been outside of the schools or outside of somebody, they should have been talking to our chancellor, and it was total quiet. We have to care about these kinds of things. We have to respond to them because obviously the political class is not doing that. Kids have to walk out of schools and say, I don't need to be here if they don't work. <laughs> and you have to be with them. So we've been in the forefront of the democracy movement in America. Now there are people all over the country 
are making moves relative to voting rights issues that will have systematic and systemic impact on people's opportunity to become more powerful. Black people are less powerful if we're only Democrats. And yes, we have to vote, fight voter suppression. We have to make sure that ID requests are not used to keep us from voting. But right now, our votes, when we vote, accrue to the Democratic Party and to the party system as a whole, but not to our benefits. We don't need parties. We need power. And we have to look at everything out there that's an opportunity and figure out which thing we want to go for. So I'm going to tell you two other things and then I'm going to stop. Um, there is this way of voting called nonpartisan elections. And what it means is that people should be able to vote for people if they're Democrats, Republicans, or Independents. And there is a way of doing it called nonpartisan elections, where in our primaries, which in New York City is our first round of voting, rather than being a Democratic primary or a Republican primary, a closed primary, it would be open to everybody. Everybody who's running for office, Democrats, Republicans, the rent is too damn high people, everybody, independents, would be on that primary ballot. And we could go into the voting booth, vote for a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, whoever we wanted to, and the top two people would be on the ballot in November. One of the things that, and they might be two Democrats, a Democrat or Republican, two independents, whomever. One of the things thing that that would do is give us power. In our communities, people are still running for office who are in jail or on their way there. And they're probably going to win because those are the people who get on the ballot in a party primary. So this is so passionate a fight. It's so important a fight. It's a fight for voting rights in the history of our people. It comes straight out of that need. It's very hard to establish partisan, nonpartisan politics in New York. We tried to through Bloomberg. And we had events all over the city. People came. Every Democratic Party leader, I swear, uh, I've never seen Charlie Rango after 9 o'clock. He was there till 12. <laughs> they came to every place, and they stood there. They made up all kinds of stuff, that if black people supported nonpartisans when it was on the ballot, that we were going to lose our right to vote, white people weren't going to let us vote, that, like, just crazy, 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 crazy stuff. Nonpartisans has been passed um, the top two in California and various other places around the country it's being worked on. We want to pass it here in New York. And when we get in a position to do that, we need for you to know what it is. And when people start putting out all the make-believe statements about it, we need for you to tell the people in your building and in your church and in your schools and in your community, don't listen to that, listen to us. We are the experts. We are in charge in our fight for democracy. So what it means to lead voting rights in 2014 is very, very different than what it meant many years ago. We have to learn how to fight in all kinds, I mean, vote in all kinds of different ways. People in Mississippi just voted on the Republican line to make sure that a right winger didn't get elected in the state. That's pretty cool. We have to exert our power, and we have to give up this notion that we don't like politics. Because what we're really saying is we don't like power, and we don't want to control our own lives. So I need for people to do this. 
I want to set up a meeting beyond this. I want people to go out and re-register. If you're not going to, I want you to admit it tonight and tell me why. We have a lot of work to do, and we can do it. But it's the we that has to do it, along with other people in the country or in the city. We don't want to just do it as black people. We want to do it as all people. And there are lots of people in this country who will join with us. Um, speaking of um, nonpartisan movements, I went to an event last week in Washington where people on the left and right, <clears throat> and when I say on the right, I mean the right, came together, myself one of them, I'm on the left. <laughs> and um, we're talking about changing the um, minimum requirements, the automatic requirements, mandated requirements when people break laws in this country, because a lot of people just discovered that who gets most hurt by that is the black community. We've known that. But there's so, there are millions of people in jail who should not be there for reasons that are insane. This is one of those things like homelessness that Fred was referencing. When you think that can't be the case. People, the jails can't be filled with black men and Latino men primarily. That just doesn't make any sense. People can't go to jail at 17 and be there at 50, but they can. So this coming together of the left and right, which I've done at other times, as I mentioned, is powerful because it's people deciding to do what you have to do in order to change what has become the reality of our world. So I want you to ask me questions. I want us to take seriously what's happening in the country. I don't really have to talk people into coming to the All-Stars in UX because you love it. The people who come there, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> I'm not trying. I do have to urge you to become more sophisticated as political people and as a political force. I need for you to learn about reforms. I have some of the best people in the country who could teach you, and you will be as articulate about this as you are about anything else in your life. We need to stand up and do something about the people who were walking past me on that corner last Saturday and walk past you every day of the week and say, we have no hope, we have no place to go. That's the corner I sleep on. Thank you. Jillian, who's from Dallas, um, who I met there a few weeks ago when I gave a talk on poverty and racism, and who spends her weekends when she can in Ferguson, and who's one of our young people who's on the front lines. She's going to give us a statement. Thank you. Give her a because I had heard about this story so many times. During the summer of 2013, I was arrested and held in a male's jail in Los Angeles for three days. The women's jail down a few blocks down, it was overcrowded. 
so they had me um, in the mail show. They held me on the charges of starting a riot. I did not start a riot. I was simply talking to the youth in the black community about why they were having to fight for justice of an unarmed black man in the year 2013. When I finally did read about the tragic of, um, death of Mike Brown, I watched some clips, but this time I didn't run out into the streets right away. All I could do at that moment was cry. Never did I think I could grieve over someone's death that I didn't know. But I do in fact know Mike Brown. I know who he represents. He represents myself. He represents my brother. He represents my nephews. He represents my father. Brown represents every black and brown man in America today. Every black and brown person in America today. Not going to Ferguson was never an option to me. The first time that I went to Ferguson, hundreds marched where Mike Brown's body had lay for four and a half hours before the police removed it. You could still see the blood residue on the ground. We live in a country where a person of color is killed every 28 hours by security or police. A country where blacks make up 13% of the population and over 50% 50, 50 of the prison industrial system. We experience the most amount of poverty and we receive the worst education. And until these numbers change, I will always be compelled to fight. Just as my ancestors. have done for me. Thank you. Um, let's give Jillian a number. I just want to make a few brief introductions. Um, one is Far. I want to introduce two women that I have been on the front lines in a variety of ways with for many, many years. Um, one of whom is Jackie Salad, who was my co- <laughs> when I was running for president. Deputy campaign manager. She was, she was my campaign manager with Fred. Um, who has um, given me a tremendous amount over the years, support and everything else. And the other is Gabriella Kurlander, who is president of the All Stars Project and has turned it into a magical list of many things that we've been able to do together for all of our kids and our communities. Jackie runs our political operation and is uh, building a very, very important reform movement and partnership with people who have money, um, and actually so is Gabrielle, so that we can accomplish the things that we're trying to accomplish. Stand and let's give them a I, I also wanted to acknowledge Willie Walker, who I saw walk in, because he follows me all over the city. Willie, where are you? Stand up so I can blow you a kiss. the head of the uh, Harlem State Office program and always gives us space. So, what are you thinking? What are your questions? Ask them. What are you going to do? How many of you are going to go and register like I asked you to? Stand up. Yes. I can do it. Oh, actually, could people make a line over here? Oh, great, because then I can hear you. Somebody write down the questions. I 
Okay, why don't you ask me and she'll take your picture while we talk. <laughs> Say your name. First name, Dan. Hi, Dan. Name, Davis. How you doing? Oh, you got up to register. Have voter registration cards, and you're going to give your name to somebody else. I mean, somebody who don't. But what do you want to say? No, I'd like to say one more thing. For the nonpartisan, wouldn't that take give uh, the Republicans a little edge? How how would that give them an edge? Because you uh, are taking uh, votes from the Democrats. Um. And now, now I want to know the significance of the difference. Okay, that's a great question. One thing is that we, I don't care about taking votes from the Democrats. I think that that way of us thinking about politics has gotten us into a lot of trouble. And they're Democrats I like, they're Republicans I like, they're Independents I like. The reality is that this fear of taking votes from the Republicans is not our fear, it's the Democratic Party's fear. And one of the ways to teach the Democratic Party something who has not come through for us in so many different ways is that we're going to vote however we want, for whomever we want, whenever we want. I mean, we used to be Republicans. But you don't have to be scared if a Democrat doesn't win. Look at what's happened to the country, and they do win. I agree. Oh, okay. <laughs> so are you going to help me take votes from the Republicans and the Democrats? Yes. Great. My name is Evans Thompson, and uh, I'm a registered Democrat. Yeah, I'm guilty. And I thought you were one of my best friends. No, I am. I am. But even though I'm a registered Democrat and they have my name on the books, when I go to vote, I can vote for anybody I want, right? Yeah. In, the, in November in New York. Okay, uh, in New York in November. Uh, talking about na national, oh, you're talking about national only now? Or? Well, national races have primaries also, right? We voted when President um, Obama, before he was elected, we had to make a choice between Obama and um, the other lady. Hillary. The reason why I'm asking is because go ahead. You know, no, go, this is important. When I go to the polls, it's very easy. You know, they open the book. My name is in there. I'm ready to vote. And uh, I don't know if I could change that now. I don't know if there would be a problem. I really don't. I can't foresee that. So what I want to do is stay a Democrat for now, and that's that's you know only by name. And then I want to go and vote for whoever I want to. But I want to make sure that I can do that. Okay. I think you can be registered any way you want. I guess what I'm raising, and in November you can vote all kinds of ways. The problem, what I want to do is to get us, I think what you're raising is important because the reality of what the Democrats are delivering and our commitment to being one is like an abyss. And that's what I want us to explore together. Because it's an abject failure. Now, if we change the system, maybe there are some Democrats that we can vote for in a nonpartisan election and some all kinds of people. But I mostly want you to go through this process with me, mostly to recognize that the Democratic Party isn't a jewel. And that in some circumstances, because of the organization of the ballot, it's very difficult to vote in ways that challenge them. If you're an independent and you vote, if we got, we have 47% of the independent vote or whatever it was for um, Michael Bloomberg, even though they didn't write about that, they noticed that. They were worried about that. They had respect for us about that and they were so scared they wouldn't put it in the newspaper. So I'm not trying to push you, I probably am trying to push you. But I hear what you're saying. I would sign up as an independent, but is that going to, I mean, you know, what's going to happen when I go to the polls uh, as the Democrat? You know what I'm saying? 
Well, when you go to the post, if you sign up as an independent, you will go as an independent. And if there's no independent running in the primary, then you, in their primary, you can't vote, but you can vote in November. Thank you. I'll keep working on that. Uh, yes, my name is Mark McPhee. I'm part of the uh, Committee for Independent Community Action. Just, yes, just last night, I was uh, at a protest rally up in White Plains against police brutality, and I have a number of my brothers here with me who were formerly incarcerated. For those who don't know, Dr. Filani, I would like for you to speak to one of the things that we often talked about. Why is it so important that we have a school that not only focuses on test scores, but on development, and also speak to the fact that we know that the pipeline from schools to prison is real. And for those who don't know it, it's very important that we focus on development. Could you please reiterate why we need to focus on development? Yes, we. Great question. Um, who are your brothers? Stand up. Stand up, brothers. Mark, you should have your mom stand up. Where's your mom? Oh. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, where Mark has learned much about development has been at the All Stars Project and his work in UX. Um, basically, what the All Stars Project promotes and projects is the importance of after school development, after school opportunities. And one of the things that we make a distinction between is learning and development. And what for us development is all about is what white middle class and well-to-do kids get naturally and normally in their lives because their families have a lot of money. So they take them places, they have all kinds of experiences. They're also connected to the mainstream of this country and the city. They go to theater, they do all kinds of things. And as I say to people, it's not that, it's not that white kids have bigger brains. That's not why they do better in school. They have bigger lives. And so because of our commitment and understanding to development, we create after-school programs where young people are able to have experiences. One very important experience is performance because performance is an activity that allows people to try new things, to, I think, have a ton of fun, and to be both who they are, but when they get on the stages at our talent show networks, to also be other than who they are. That's very growthful and it makes people bigger and gives them a bigger sense of the world. So the school system and the educational system in this country does not speak to the issue of development. They don't talk about development. It's not a methodology that they teach in, their, in the educational schools. It's something that we know something about. And many people understand that the further after school activities is, from what happens inside of school, the more likely the experience is going to be valuable if it's qualitative and developmental. One of the problems with after school in traditional high schools and public schools is that they extend the school day, but they don't extend the kids' experiences. So development is very powerful, and Mark is referencing it because he's been part of our adult learning community, and they've done all kinds of things. It's so wonderful to see people come in 60 years old, I don't know, Mark's not 60, and, and go to a public speaking class or an improvisation class, um, an acting class, do something unusual for the very first time in their lives and discover that they can do that, that you can perform in ways that you just never had any expectation to be able to. And as a person who's older, a lot of times in our communities, we just sort of sit in the community. We don't go anywhere, we don't do anything, we don't have a lot of money, and then you can drop in at UX 
almost every day, any time of the day, and participate in activities that help you to grow. And so when you're growing the parents and you're growing the kids, you're growing the community. So you should all come out to All Star. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Figueroa. I have a little short story to share because I have a question and also deal with politics mm -hmm. and also with the um, African American Latino um, communities. I was homeless for a very long time with both my children and domestic violence with them, and I've seen it all shelters from shelters. Har I seen horrible, horrible things happen. So especially Latinos and African Americans. And it's sad how we have to actually, someone that actually wants to make a change, they make it so hard. And when you go to schools and you talk to schools and you ask for help, they actually close the doors on you. And actually it happened to me personally. A few months ago, I went to one of the counselors in my school and they told me on my face, you're never gonna get nowhere, you're never gonna be successful and you're never gonna do nothing with your life. So that's what made me change and have the mentality I have now. So he told me that six months ago when I was homeless. Two months later, I made a major impact where I got my apartment. I actually got it on my own. I got two city jobs and now I'm actually... Um, the president and also the founder for Team Success that I actually created at Bronx Community College. And I have about 357 students following me and they're really excited. Um, the situation that's going on now is I recruited students where I formed this team to provide services where I could be able to help them become successful because I believe in every one of the students. I believe, I know as the same way a white person could be successful, African American can and a Spanish person can. And I have all these students and we're trying to make our voice count and trying to work so hard to work as a team to help each other and it's all politics. They're like, no, you can't do this, you can't. They can't give us that permission, but if we try to look for help outside, oh no, then we're gonna end up getting arrested. I don't want them to, that to happen. So who's the day you say no? Um, politics of school and politics of democracy. And so I don't, right now at this point, it's like we're about to, like, they're forcing us to, like, separate. Or if not, why don't you go, why don't you come see me? Mm -hmm. And we'll figure this out because um, I would love to work with you. We would love to work with you, and we don't say no. Can <laughs> 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 you right, tell us how you developed and that you just decided to become an independent? <laughs> well, first of all, my name is Leslie Francis. First of all, I want to thank you and your staff at the All-Stars for everything that you do, the hard work that you do. And for me to come out of retirement a year ago and volunteer there says a lot about the influence and the kindness and the type of people that you have working with you. So I just want to say thank you to everybody from the All-Stars. I retired in 09, and when I retired, I wasn't doing anything. I was actually miserable. When I found the All Stars Project and joined them, this has opened up my mind. It has um, de helped me. She talked about development. Well, it has developed me. If you think that a 67-year-old man can be developed, I'm a witness. It can happen. done so many things there, met so many people, took so many classes, it's unbelievable. And talk about racism, I thought I knew racism. I'm from the 60s. And some of the classes that I've taken at the All Stars
show me that I didn't know anything about racism. I am angry at the state of the city, of politics. You talk about the Democrats, I'm a Democrat. I've been a Democrat all my life. Not because I knew too much about the Democrat, Democratic Party, it's because that's what my family did and it was tradition. And now I'm so fed up with the Democrats. You know, I'm looking for something else to do. But I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I am totally disgusted with what I see in the newspapers, the police, and everything. I applaud this young lady here for what she's been doing. We need more and more people like her. And we need some senior citizens. We can speak and do a lot. So again, I thank you. And good night. Thank you. Yes. Greetings. Monroe is my name. I'm tired of uh, voting and hoping. I want to donate and dictate. The nonprofit is that good? Is it going to be a movement? It is a movement. It's going to be an agenda, a concept, and we're going to be targeting. I say we because I'm going to participate in that capacity. Are we going to be targeting issues? Actually, I want, Jackie, could you come up and talk about what we're doing around the country? So I'm going to sit like that. Are you finished? Oh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> This is Jackie Sarah. Uh, yeah, I uh, thank you, Dr. Fulani, for, for this opportunity. And I uh, just wanted to say hello to everyone. When, as different people were speaking, and also during your remarks, I was thinking that um, I've just come back from being uh, on the road in Oregon. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest and then in Arizona. Uh, in Oregon, there's a campaign underway right now to try to implement a nonpartisan system. In Oregon, there are 650,000 independent voters who are not permitted to vote in the primaries and are consequently disenfranchised. Many are young. This is about 31% of the electorate in Oregon, and there's an initiative on the ballot uh, this November uh, which would change the system to a nonpartisan system so that everyone would be allowed to vote in every round of voting. Uh, after Oregon, uh, my team and I traveled to Arizona and met with a group of people who are looking to bring this issue to the voters uh, in uh, two years, in 2016. Uh, and uh, many, many more states around the country are considering this. The thing I wanted to share with people here tonight, uh, and this is something that uh, Dr. Filani has taught me very um, insistently over the years, is that um, if the issue on the table is change, which is what so many people are talking about here, it can't be the case that you want change, but you get told, here's the only way you're allowed to fight for change. <laughs> because if you need change, oftentimes that includes change in the way that you conduct fights. And I think that uh, one of the things that we're seeing now in the country is that so many people from so many different walks of life want change, but we're told, well, here's the way that you do it. You be a Democrat, you be a this, you be a that, and you have to work through the party system. To me, the idea that there's a condition that is imposed upon people as a qualification for being able to vote, namely that you be a member of a political party, is a violation of the most fundamental principles of democracy. We are Americans, we are entitled to have the right to vote in every round of voting without being required to join a political organization as a precondition for casting a ballot. That is wrong. And 
so the, the movement that Dr. Kalani is talking about here, and she has been an outspoken voice in this from the very, very beginnings, is a movement that says that very simply. Everyone, regardless of their party affiliation or decision to not be in a party, should have equal access to the voting process. It's that simple. That's what we want. But the political system is so entrenched and so oriented in the direction of parties that it's very hard to get there, and it's even hard to imagine getting there. But I think what, what is so wonderful and so important about this discussion tonight is that's what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about the connection between how we're going to mobilize, mobilize ourselves to respond to the crisis of poverty and at the same time demand that we are going to change the ways that we conduct that fight because the old avenues of doing that have not gotten us to a solution to this humanitarian crisis. That's what the movement is about. Thank you. Jack, you could stay up here if you want. <laughs> um, my name is Roger Dennis, Hi, and among other things, uh, I'm a retired New York City teacher, high school. Um, and the piece that I want to bring to this conversation, just to relate partly to what Mark was talking about, and also the idea that, as you said, Dr. Falani and a few other people said, we have to get the youth involved. And enough of the youth don't know what's really going on. Right? Well, here's the piece that I want to bring that hardly anybody knows about. The school system is not going to change, in my opinion. The, the adults, are, it might change, but it's not going to change through the mayor or the chancellor or any of the adults in the school system. Uh, but there is a, a movement that is going on uh, nationally and internationally called unschooling, which could be a way to do something with our young people. Unschooling means that instead of kids having to stay in school and get that diploma so they can go to college or get a better job, we could set up homeschool resource centers throughout the city, throughout Newark, throughout Dallas, all over the place, little pockets of 20, 30, 40 students, legal, because they're homeschool resource centers. You just sign them out of the, if they're in a school that's not working for them, which most of our kids are, they can sign out of regular school and they can be in this homeschool resource center. Uh, totally legal and they can study. There's, a, there's different ways you can do it. You can either have like, one of my favorites is North Star up in Hadley, Massachusetts. Um, that's one where it's for teenagers, okay? Uh, there are some of them are for younger kids also. But North Star, kids study whatever they're interested in whatever they're interested in. And imagine a society where people were able to work at what they're interested in. Okay. Thank you. I like North Star a lot. So thanks for your contribution. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Johnson. Hi, Mr. Johnson. And I live in a city building. I've been in Manhattan for about 45 years. And I'm very glad to be here tonight because I came in a little pain. I've been in pain for a while because living in a city building, which I say the projects, the police doesn't come here. If you call the police, they'll say, well, we only have one car for this area. So from 110th Street to the Polo Ground, I know that like I know me for 45 years I've been in this area. You know, everywhere they opened up a, a place where a co-op, a condominium, the police would be there 24-7. But if I go from the polo ground to Padmark to 145th Street and 8th Avenue, right. at 12 o'clock at night, I'd be scared to go home. I'd be scared to come out of my house. We have people that come to the projects and stand on the doorway and do what they want to do. 
you call the police, they say we only got one car for that area. But if you go to Bradhurst and 145th Street by Starbucks, by the city bank, police is everywhere. But in the city building, they don't. What are you in pain about, or are you just pissed off? I'm in pain because whenever I go to the rent office and make a complaint, whenever I go to 250 Broadway to inspect the general's office, they say, well, we suggest that you move. <laughs> so uh, I've been going in a circle for so long to, uh, by me being here tonight, that even some of my pain. Great. You know, and I deal with this 24 7. I, I think that, I mean, basically what you're talking about every, is an issue of power, and it's whether or not you, we have the muscle to make people, including police, um, police our communities in ways that we want. And I know the polar grounds, and a lot of these places have just been uh, abandoned. And even though this seems like a little issue, it's a big issue, it's something that needs to be worked on with people coming together perhaps in the polo grounds and putting some pressure on the people, again, who represent you. I don't know quite what to do about it, but we can talk about it. And I'm glad that you're here, because that's what we do. We talk about things to ease the pain and then figure out what we can do about it. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Could you talk directly into? Yeah. Yes, my name is Andre Johnson. Um, I admire what you're doing this evening. Thank you. Right. I don't know how I wind up here. I know people just email me, text me, and say it's a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I make meetings, Democratic meetings, coalition meetings all over the place. This is the best one you've okay, come to in a long time. Right, this is nice. It's really great, you know. And, and I hear you speaking about some independent. Um, I'm just like a person that's all over the place, you know. Um, I know as growing up, right, um, my parents, right, we grew up on welfare, things like that nature, right, um, and projects and things that were given to us and peanut butter and jelly and cheese lines and things like that. And, um, and, and it was like um, everybody wanted to have the best pair of sneakers and, and my mother could do the best, she tried to do the best she can do it. And, and the result, people like you grew up and said, we want to fight and independent, do these things, right? Um, well, I'm getting at it's like, uh, like, like, uh, uh, and, and I'm not a racist person, right? But we went, we've been through a lot, right? I'm a black American, right? Uh, and my family probably come from the South or something like that, right? But um, I know one thing is like, uh, we didn't have much, man. You know what I mean? And we seen a lot of people like Al Sharpton fighting for civil rights and things like that, you know? And, 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 and as a result, like, like my mom's, like, she was, she was in abusive relationships, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I'm a product of uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, relationship, you know what I'm saying? It's Can I ask up. you a question? Yes, ma'am. What are you doing now? What I'm doing now, basically I'm a wholesaler. You know, I, I've learned from the streets. Right. You sell homes? No, I, I sell products. Products. I just also sell products on the street. But, but anyway, what I'm getting at with this, right, you spoke about independent, 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 right? Um, yeah, that's it. And, 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 and things, but, 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 but kids, when, when they go to classes and, and, and learn things, and, and, and um, you know, um, like, um, like, they talent. You know what I'm saying? The kids' talent, bringing out talent, things like that. You know what I mean? There's a lot of kids, these days, like, like, just lost. Man. You know what I'm saying? And, um, Can I, I'm going to make you stop talking. Yeah. Um, I want you to come to the All Stars, and then we can have this conversation in more fully. Because I agree, I think the world is very confused. I do support having kids having the best sneakers. And, well, I think, you know, you know, um, and I think there is a lot of stuff to work on. Right. But I have to stop you because okay. there's a line behind you. Yeah. Are you going to come to the All Stars? I'll be here. All right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Fatima Hafiz, and Dr. Kalani, thank you for. Hi. Uh, <laughs> 
I also um, would like to thank the producers of the organizing to bring this together. And I also would like to just invite, and this has nothing to do with partisan, but it has to do with who we have in the room. And so I would also like to invite us to think about young people who have children, who want to be in a space like this, but their children might pose a problem for adults sometimes in terms of talking or energy, that perhaps when we organize, that we organize so that we have space for parents, young parents who have children because they are the ones who will sustain any movement that happens. And I say this because I was a very young mother and the places that I went, if my children weren't invited, I wouldn't be there, which means that I wouldn't develop. And so it's really important for us to think about that. And that's what I want to offer. Thanks, Tom. Fatima is a um, doctor, she's a psychologist, and she's been doing work in my hometown uh, of Chester, Pennsylvania, and we just met about six months ago, and she's a great leader. Give her a note. Just a quick question, part of my ignorance. Who actually is running in the midterms for the independent party and what is their platform. I just want to know who is it is and what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, there are probably independents running around the country and I don't actually know who they are. Nobody's running in New York State. Is that true? I'm looking at Kathy and making this up. There are some. Name them. <laughs> There's a handful of independent candidates. But maybe a way to think about it is one Kat, of Kathy, could you go to the mic? Sure. Maybe a way to think about your question is that one thing that's happening around the country, less so in New York, more so around the country, is that there's a growing number of independent candidates that are gaining momentum. So in the midterm elections in the U.S. Senate races, there's at least three states where independent candidates have a shot at winning. Now what's important about that is these are independent candidates um, one of whom is Greg Orman in Kansas, one of whom is a uh, former U.S. Senator Larry Pressler, another is uh, a candidate running in South Dakota. They are running because they recognize there has to be a political restructuring of the way we hold our elections. To go to something that Jackie was pointing to, if we want change, if we want different outcomes, we need a different process that feeds into them. So, that's one thing that's very valuable. But when we talk about independence, we're talking about a movement that's not centered around candidates. It's centered around voters. So, I mean, I'll throw those in the mix. Thank you. So what are we here supposed to be doing right now? Well, one thing is that you're thinking about participating and building the independent movement in this city. Yeah, so we can make it work for us and all the problems that we have. Yes, and also, yes, and you're also learning about the difference be between party voting uh -huh. and participating in building a movement where parties don't determine what you do or don't do. That's very, very important. important. Yes, and sometimes when we go to the polls, I mean, basically when we go to the polls, we vote for Democrats, even if the devil is on the ballot. So sometimes, even when you don't have a choice that you prefer, it's important not to participate. People are taught that no matter who's running, you should vote, but that's crazy. Right. So what we're, what I'm trying to turn you on to, uh -huh. <laughs> and the rest of the people in this room, is the importance of doing something that's innovative outside of the box, learning what it means to build an independent movement, learning about the processes that we've been speaking about, looking at it growing around the country, and helping us to build it here around the issues that we're talking about. Great. And who's representing us right here? Um, probably 30 people here. 30 people here? Kathy's one of them. Okay. Alvader. Jesse. Jesse. I'll represent you. Hmm? Yeah, more than 30, right? More than 30. 
So you should give us your, we have your name. We're gonna, I'm gonna call a meeting to talk more politics. I'm gonna let you know things that are going on in the city and we're gonna call everybody because I don't know who not to call. Okay, so make sure you sign up. Thank you guys. Hi, I'm Ashley Bartholomew from Boston Community College. Hi, Ashley. Uh, hi, I like the part where you talk about building more experiences for students so they'd be more interested in the school and learning. Uh, when I was applying for high schools, like you needed a certain GPA from middle school to get into those schools, the ones with the best art programs and um, drama and all of that theater and everything. But the school that I, I ended up going to, it, that's the only school that took my GPA in. It had an art program, but it was canceled. And I noticed a lot of the, the lower schools, they don't really have any good programs. And that's why a lot of kids are dropping out and not coming to school. So when you said build more experience for the children, and you talked about the Art Star program, can you elaborate more on that? We're at 543, is that, is that true? <laughs> West, <laughs> I can't tell it was my view. At 543 West 42nd Street, um, and we're between 10th and 11th. We're open seven days a week. And you can come there and get a brochure, and you can go be in any program that you want. And we have people who teach art and all kinds of things. So we have classes and then we have youth programs. How old are you? 20. 20. Are you going to come tomorrow? I will. Do you have a website? Yes. Okay. There are packets outside that have all this information in it. Okay. Good. I'll, I will be looking for you. Yay! This is going to be the last question. The last for this. Hi, Dr. Floyd. Hi, How are you? Uh, my name is Terry Price, and I've been a student of the All Star. This phenomenal, the All Should Come. So my, I have two things, food for thought. One is about uh, your opinion of charter schools and um, what could we do about gangs? Because kids usually join gangs because they want to feel um, part of something. So, you know, think about what we could do about that situation. Mm -hmm. In charter schools, some people are opposed to it, some people are not. And the third question is, somebody that. said something to me about um, let's stay Democrat and vote all the Senate Democrat in to help Obama pass all the things he hasn't been able to pass before he leaves office. I rest my case. Um, first question. I like all kinds of choices. I think that people in our communities should be able to go to public schools, private schools, and charters. I strongly dislike the battle that goes on relative to charters and um, other kinds of the, the uh, traditional public school. I think that there are issues involved in them, and I think that parents and people in our community shouldn't get caught up in the fights that are going on, because a lot of the fights are political. They're, and they're bad political. <laughs> they're not about really what's best for the kids. It's a fight because the teachers union doesn't like charter schools, or the people who run the charter schools think that they're czars. That's not our fight. We want every choice that's possible for our kids, and we should be leading that fight, and we shouldn't get caught up in others' battles. The charter schools are good if they're good, and the public schools are really a mess. And one of the things that charter schools does, the regular public schools, is put pressure on traditional schools. And if we can focus on the right fight, maybe we could impact them. I wouldn't hold my breath. But I think we have to use almost everything, and then you should use after school. People should use our programs. Putting young people in things that they like, that they like to do, um, and exposing them to the world is so powerful and so profound, and they just grow dramatically, and they learn how to make good choices about things. Relative to gangs, um, if young people are in gangs that are negative, it's our fault. 
has not, it's not the kid's fault. If the kids had something po positive to do, they would go do it. In most of our communities, the community centers are closed. Teenagers can't be in the park after six o'clock. If, they they, if they're in the park, they get run out. They can't be in the community center with little kids. It's like crazy. What we're doing, what we allow to happen is an outrage. The centers should be available, but they're not. So you should use what is available. And obviously, we have programs. Um, I don't know that there's anything to do to help Obama at this point. I, I think if you vote for the Senate, the Democrats in the Senate, you're just voting for the Democrats because that's what we do. I don't know that that's going to deliver him in some ways that's going to make a big difference in our lives. If you want to support Obama in ways, you should figure out ways to vote, uh, support him. But everything that goes on in our communities that's political cannot be resolved by voting for Democrats. You already voted for Obama. We voted for Obama big time. Obama went to the White House and the Democratic Party said, you belong to us and not the community. And as far as I'm concerned, he's not put up a big enough fight to resist that. So how many people in here are gonna do the things I want done? Raise your hands. Okay, I believe you. So we're gonna have we're going to have a part two of this meeting. We're going to be invited to different things that are happening in the community, in the city. You're going to learn more about independent politics and what it means to fight for democracy. You're going to come to the center and develop like my 67-year-old pal over here. Um, and I love you dearly for coming out. Oh, wait. Two people asked me to make announcements. One is about the play that's about to open up at the um, Castile Center, which is part of the All-Stars Project. It's called Still on the Corner. It is a magnificent play, and it opens when? November 7th. November 7th, until? December 14th. Okay, so everybody should come to the play. Um, anyway, thank you all. I, I am so touched that you all came out. I need you. I love you. Let's go out and change the world together.